first of all, why did you pick this film? You told me to, no. Uh, <laughs> this is uh, by a long way my favorite Sherlock Holmes film. And really, although it's difficult to say what's your definitive favorite film, it's probably my favorite film. I think it sort of does everything I want a film to do. If, if this was on on a bank holiday Monday, I would be very pleased. It has that kind of wintry afternoon feel. Um, I saw it when I was very young and it profoundly affected me. I think it's both uh, a brilliant, respectful uh, homage to Conan Doyle and yet an incredibly irreverent take on it. It's Billy Wilder, uh, who was one of the most sophisticated and brilliant filmmakers we've ever had, um, and it's Sherlock Holmes. It's sort of, it's a funny thing, I, I actually introduced this film about three or four years ago uh, at, a, at a book festival, and I spent the whole time talking about how wonderfully melancholy it was. And then it started, and I, I thought, I've forgotten, it's incredibly funny, <laughs> uh, which it is. Uh, and, and principally, I think, because it's, along with the Basil Rathbone films, it's the great influence on, on our TV series, uh, because it's, it's precisely as, as, as reverent as Conan Doyle was himself, i.e. not very. But at its absolute essence, it re they, Wilder and Izzy Diamond, who co-wrote the screenplay, they love Sherlock Holmes. And, and Wilder and you grew up with the, uh, uh, I know rather, I didn't know. Um, he grew up with the stories as a boy in, in Austria and uh, just was devoted to them. And he wanted to make a musical version, mm, all kinds yeah. of things, and eventually became this curious, huge film. One of the last of those um, sort of uh, late 60s films. It was going to be a, a roadshow picture. It lost an hour, as you may know. Uh, there's, there's missing portions. Um, but that's sort of part of its legend somehow, isn't it? It's, it's sort of, the whole film was about loss, and the fact that there's actually a, a, a missing hour is kind of perfect. Um, it's just, I, I just adore it, to answer your question. <laughs> no, you actually, you, you didn't answer my question. You just answered every single one I've listed um, Stay with Billy Wilder a moment. I'm, I'm just curious about that trend of directors, particularly from Europe, and, and certainly many Austrian and German directors who've gone over to Hollywood, uh, going back to the silent era, um, right through to directors such as Vin Wenders, who have their own take on a particular kind of Americana. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how much you feel Billy Wilder's take as an outsider has over taking Sherlock Holmes, which by this time had become pretty staid, both in television and film, and rejuvenating it. I mean, well, I mean the most sort of familiar thing about Wilder was that he was very cynical and that his films are always, we were just talking about Ace in the Hole or Sunset Boulevard, incredibly cynical films. Um, sometimes like nasty tinge to them in a way. Uh, but I think somehow his, maybe it's his childhood nostalgia for Sherlock Holmes and then his, his take on, on Britain, the Britain that, that it represented, the sort of old empire, uh, is, is a lot more um, gentle, or, or not, maybe not gentle, but sort of affectionate really. Um, it's a very touching film. Um, and maybe that was to do with him by 1970 becoming a much a slightly mellower, I don't know. But um, I think it's very, it's very interesting that, that there is an, it's an outsider's view. Like um, James Ivory, uh, who, who made the most English films there's ever been as an American. Uh, or, you know, uh, people often say that about Henry James as a, as a writer. His, mm. his stories are actually almost more English than, than, than we are. So. Um, I think it's um, it's an outsider's view, definitely. But but what you get in the end, whatever their original ambition is, uh, is a very nuanced and funny portrait of, of something he, he loved. But in in a very particular Billy Wilder way, he wanted to do something with it. I think that's the key to it. He didn't just want to do a straight adaptation. So as you'll see, each um, each part of it certainly resonates from the original. And one of the main story is sort of based on. Uh, on the Bruce Partington plans, but only very tangentially. But it's, it's, it's him and uh, Izzy Diamond sort of taking it and running with it, I think. And you mentioned a moment ago about <coughs> this being sort of a last gasp of, of a particular kind of Hollywood. This was made in 1970, so in 68, you had Bonnie and Clyde, the following year, Easy Rider. Uh, and what's interesting about this is not so much narratively, I feel, that there's a sense of a classical Hollywood director at work, but sort of wistful palette mm -hmm. that's employed for the film. It, 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 had a, it has a very unique look. 
Yeah, I think it does. I mean, as I say, it's a, you know, you can, you can over-examine these things, which is why we're here. Uh, <laughs> but that, and that's part of the joy of it, especially if you know a film very well. You can find a fellow enthusiast. I remember meeting Jonathan Coe, who is one of this film's great supporters, who wrote a, a wonderful article about his lifelong association with this film, from seeing the paperback when he was on holiday, aged eight, to finally finding the laser disc with the missing bits. And it's wonderful, like sort of archaeological expedition. Um, and when you meet someone who knows the film you love like that, it's, it's wonderful to, to, um, to, to examine that. But um, I'm sorry, I've totally lost my thread. Just in terms of... Sorry, well, I often I'm saying that. that the look of the film is very yes, much yes. classical Hollywood. And, and, and you can sort of look at... There are certain bits. There's a bit in the Diogenes Club where... Uh, uh, with, with, with cigar ash. Mm. And I, I've, read, I've read a whole thing about how yeah. this sort of represents this, the fag end of empire and the the fag end of Victoriana, and the whole thing is about everything crumbling around Sherlock Holmes, uh, which is, is a version, or I don't know, it's a funny joke, probably. <laughs> I think that's probably what it is. But it, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely got a, it, its heart is melancholy, and I think that's what Wilder did best. And it's certainly always the thing that I respond most to in, in anything, is a sort of bittersweet quality. So it's, it, it's, it's the, the parody is so sublime but it, at its heart, it's, it's deeply touching. And you're right about Wilder is, is, seems to be a director for whom writers have a particular favourite. I know Kazuo Ishiguro talks about Ace in the Hole. Mm. Um, and you mentioned earlier that um, Woody Allen apparently somewhere said he doesn't like Some Like It Hot. Yes, and I said, nobody's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> please, I'm pleased with that. <laughs> I may use it again. Um, <clears throat> You mentioned this as an inspiration. Um, and one of the other kind of odd Sherlock Holmes films from the 1970s that um, I, this was my first Sherlock Holmes adaptation that I'd seen, and I think it might have been the second, was Nick Meyer's The 7% Solution. And has, has that had any influence at all, or is, has it always just been this version? Well, as I said, I mean, the big, it's, it's between Rathbone and this, in a way. Uh, Everything is canonical, the way you sort of absorb it all. Don't you? I remember I read The Seven Percent Solution before I saw it, and I was very disappointed in the film. And I sort of remained disappointed, I think, because Nicole Williamson's Sherlock Holmes is so strange. And mm. it's, I don't know, and, and then you can't get past Robert Duvall's accent. You just can't. <laughs> there should be a law against it. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a wonderful idea. I, just, yeah. I think it's probably a better book than a film. But to me, this, this film has, has it all. It's kind of... And, and when you, as I finally did see the missing bits, which again, in a, in a perfect way, in themselves are incomplete. There is the, the soundtrack of one case and no pictures, and the pictures of one case and no soundtrack. So even then, it's sort of insubstantial. But um, it, it's just wonderful to have so much of your, as it were, your favorite version. And it, what's, in, what's really interesting is that, you know, that Robert Stevens is by no means anyone's idea of Sherlock Holmes. He, 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 as you'll see, he's, it's a sort of, it's a curious portrayal. He's very, it's, almost, it's very camp, actually, and he wears a lot of eye makeup <laughs> in a very late 60s way. But it sort of fits this film perfectly. Colin Blakely, I think, is like, is like almost, almost the perfect Dr. Watson, almost. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he could have played it in any number of, of versions, I think. He's just an incredibly funny man who has a heart of gold, you know. But... It's a very particular thing, um, and I suppose that's why you, I respond to it so much. Uh, I, I mean, Christopher Lee's Mycroft, though, is, is, is directly why my Mycroft is, is like that, because um, it, it felt to us that what Wilder was doing was, um, was taking a sort of one-joke character and making it more sophisticated, that uh, the Diogenes Club are actually sort of the, the British Secret Service. Uh, and they're, they're, they're behind lots of things, you know. And the whole idea of, of the, the brothers having a much more fractious relationship is, is entirely from, from this film. And I'm right in thinking that, that Mycroft had appeared in four stories. Two stories. Two stories. He's met, he briefly appears also in The Final Problem. He's driving the carriage that takes Dr. Watson to the railway station. But you only find that out in The Empty House. <laughs> Otherwise, it's just two stories. And you're right, he... he, he in the books, he's just really seen as clever but overweight, and that's pretty much yeah, it. Yeah. Um, I've read somewhere, and I, I, I could be wrong, but Alan Moore in Extraordinary League of Gentlemen 
has him as M, mm -hmm. Bond's boss, doesn't he? Yes, it's clever, isn't it? I mean, well, that's, it's brilliant that um, the film wasn't. <laughs> 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 but the, um, the way that he absolutely, you know, interlaces almost every aspect of late 19th century <laughs> literature is, is breathtaking, really. And the idea of M being Mycroft being slash Moriarty and everything, it's, it's really wonderfully done that. And the critical reception of the film is quite interesting because it's late in Wilder's career. Mm. I think he had another five or six films in him, but um, you know, some people have suggested this may have been one of the larger nails in his career coffin because it cost so much money. And it didn't work. It, and it didn't work at all. Yeah. And it was box office and critical reception. Yeah. Um, do you, uh, when's the last time you saw it? And last week, probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that long ago, actually. Um, but I remember I, I, I saw it on TV, and then uh, one of my you know, epiphany moments was uh, my sister bought me a, a wonderful book by David Stewart Davis called Homes of the Movies, One Christmas. And I grew up with that. I don't, I don't think David feels the same way anymore either, but I grew up with the idea that, that it was a noble failure that it sort of starts okay and then goes downhill. And you sort of, you know, you often do that. You buy into the, the, the idea of a film, or the critical reception, you go, oh yes, it was like that. And then, and then obviously sometimes there is a perversity about people wanting to like the things that nobody else likes. That often, as we know, this building is founded on that idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but sometimes it's true. And sometimes it's not just people, people being sort of um, deliberately first, it's because actually it, it hadn't found its time. And over the years, what's wonderful about this is it's, it's, com it's so matured. So many people love this film now. And you can see it properly uh, in the line of Wilder's work, but very much in the, in the sort of line of, of Sherlock Holmes movies, which, as you say, you know, in the 60s had become, after studying terror with John Neville, that people just didn't know what to do with it anymore, I think. So, um, I'm sure it, at the time it was, and Wilder famously never talked about it, scarcely talked about it, and, and in that annoying way kind of w couldn't be one round, you know. Uh, but I think that's, that's what happens with a lot of directors. If they have a commercial failure, uh, they just forget about it. Um, and I think he finally came to terms with the fact that people liked it, but um, not as much as uh, I think he should, you know, that it's, it's, it's such a, it's a very personal work, I think, and a very, yeah profound one.